Uh, well, gosh, uh, last one of the of the day. I really, I think this was an incredibly good idea uh, to have you guys have an opportunity to listen to sort of the the, the stuff behind the scenes, uh, and I'm, I'm really honored to uh, to be part of this. Uh, I'm the president of the Natural Hazard Mitigation Association. I want to talk a little bit about what we are. Uh, we are a grassroots organization talking about hazard mitigation and climate adaptation. As, as we use the term hazard mitigation, we're talking about reducing the risks and consequences of disasters. And we primarily focus in on the local level, supporting local folks and the whole community, not just the government, but the business, the industry, the folks that will be most savagely and horribly afflicted by the disasters of the future. Members include individuals, organizations, engineers, architects, planners, practitioners, grassroots organizers, uh, and we really want to try and interest you in what we are trying to do. We have four major initiatives that I like to talk about very, very briefly. First is what we call a living mosaic. We used to call this patchwork quilt. It's a compilation of an approach to solving problems. And fundamentally, I think the most important thing about this is the, the tremendous emphasis we put on what we call half done as well begun. Uh, you've all heard the Benjamin Franklin quote, I think it's attributed to, to Ben anyway, that well begun is half done, right? Well, suppose we told you how to do half the necessary disaster risk reduction in the future. We can do that. And it's done through requiring safe and proper construction. Demographers tell us, Arthur, Dr. Arthur Nelson tells us, that one half of the improved square footage of real estate that we will have in this nation in 2050 does not exist today. We can significantly solve our problems just by building safely and properly across the whole spectrum of resilience. Not just looking at disaster risk reduction, looking at green infrastructure, water quality, water quantity, reduction of greenhouse gases, all of that. It's a very difficult challenge, but it's one that we have to make or we are gonna be creating more and more disaster damages and seriously Im imperiling disadvantaged populations, people of color, single moms, small businesses, all those folks. We have a network of folks called the Resilient Neighbors Network who talk to each other and provide expertise on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. We're in the process of developing what we call a Disaster Risk Reduction Ambassador Program. And this is a curriculum of study to help local folks be knowledgeable about how to reduce disasters so that they can interject those concepts into local discussions about resilience. A lot of people uh, look at resilience as carbon sequestration, incredibly important. Lowering miles driven, more use of mass transit, energy efficiency, all that's important, but so too is disaster risk reduction. And then we have outreach to non-traditional partners. So we have documents that were developed and work, developed for people, and they actually work at the local level. The resilient neighbors are folks at the local level, various levels of government, private, uh, nonprofit groups, who are working together and provide each other peer-to-peer -peer information on how to reduce disasters. We've got this program that I just described that is in process, and we've got outreach to all sorts of non-traditional people. The Brookings Institute, the Center for Clean Air Policy, reinsurance companies, the climate change community, to interject to folks that everybody in this much larger community Harvard Graduate School of Design, the Department of the Treasury, Kresge, Garrison, all of these people have to be brought together thinking about policy documents, reforming uh, federal policy. We, we have demonstrated uh, with, with the uh, help of the uh, folks at the Brookings Institute that if we change some federal policy, some pretty simple changes to federal policy, we can change about, save about $40 billion over 10 years. And, and I think it was Everett McKinley Dirksen who said, a ah, billion dollars here and a billion dollars there, next thing you're talking about real money, right? Well, 40 billion ducks, that's, that's, that's something worth talking about. But even more than that, it's 40 billion dollars worth of misery prevented. 
That's the way we have to look at this. We need to look at who takes it in the neck when society screws up with improper development. It's the most disadvantaged populations, the underrepresented people, the people who are barely getting by day to day and week to week, and a disaster comes along and they are really, really hurting. And that's not just Native Americans. It's not just people of color. It's your small business people. It's your single mom. It's the folks that work for an hourly wage. All of those people really take it in the neck from foreseeable natural disasters. A fundamental thought for all of you. Come on, a question. A question for the group here. Wake up out there. What's the one single best form of disaster relief? There is only one. There is only one best form of disaster relief. What is it? Don't have a disaster. Build safely, build properly. Is this achievable? Well, probably not. Not universally. There will always be black swan events, stuff that we didn't see coming at us. It's like, I just didn't see that. But was Hurricane Katrina a foreseeable disaster? Oh, you bet it was. And I'd be happy to tell stories about the 1995 exercise 10 years before Hurricane Katrina that conclusively showed just how bad it was. Was Sandy foreseeable? You bet. And are much worse storms in terms of impact and flooding foreseeable? Oh, yes. Not only foreseeable, but foreseen. Written down on sheets of paper. This stuff is here, it's coming, but we want to try and avoid what we can. Let us be absolutely clear. We are losing the battle for a sustainable society, a resilient society, in the United States and throughout the world. That is just so. I have chapter, book, and verse to document that. Disasters are bad and getting worse and will be worse in the future. Right now, when we do flood insurance rate maps, flood insurance rate maps, everybody kind of know them, they are exclusively based upon yesterday's climate, what they call hindcasting, looking in the back. One of my friends who was a, once a federal insurance administrator described what we do as driving an 18-wheel rig 80 miles an hour down the highway, steering by looking in the rearview mirrors. Not likely to produce a very pleasant or safe outcome. That's what we do. We need to do things differently and better. Climate change, climate uncertainty requires us to do this. So how do we proceed? Well, I, I think it's very important that we not try necessarily to change people's beliefs. There are some people who don't think but know exactly and precisely what climate change is. It's a vast left-wing conspiracy. It has to do with funding Obamacare, implementing UN Agenda 21 to take away golf courses and guns. And they know that for a fact. That's their belief, and it's not likely to change. We need to reach out to them with principled negotiation to change behavior. Yes, we want to educate people. Yes, we want to train minds but we most especially want to change behavior that is going to harm people. We need to deliver a message of safety, sustainability to people in a message that they will understand in their lingo. I do a lot of lecturing in places that are, well, gee, I, I don't know if the word is conservative or high property rights protection, Idaho. Montana, Northern California, Utah. The message there is stewardship of the earth, future generations, doing things so that your children's children enjoy the quality of life that we enjoy here in this beautiful Idaho, Montana, Utah, Northern California. If I started talking about climate change, shut down. So we need to talk to people in their own lingo. I need to talk to people from EPA about water quality.
quality. We need to talk to people from HUD about community development. Because people are in their silos, they're in their areas of comfort. So we need to talk about the win-win multi-part solutions that we're hearing about in, in California. Looking at multiple different objectives. Often it's the same darn thing that needs doing, but it has to be described in totally different terms depending upon which one is the funding agency. If I go to EPA with this wonderful idea, brilliant idea, and it will prevent flooding, it may not be as well received. But if I can show how this is going to do groundwater protection and be something, a, a best management practice for water quality on steroids, that might be better received. Same thing, absolute same thing. We need to get the message across that we're not talking about no development. We're talking about safe development. One of the greatest climate change deniers in the United States, or climate change believers that it doesn't exist, I guess I should say, I don't think he liked being called a denier, is Jim Imhoff, Senator Imhoff. He don't, he don't believe that. He's written a book. I don't know how many of you read it. I read it. Uh, and he doesn't believe in this. I mean, it's at, and that's, I don't believe that's likely to change anytime soon. However, Jim Imhoff is part of a tremendous effort that comes out of <coughs> Oklahoma with respect to the construction and promulgation of the concept of safe rooms for people in their homes and their businesses. Now, if he had been approached that climate change is inducing more tornadoes in Oklahoma and you need a safe room, no sale. But having safety for families, oh, this is good. So on his Senate website is stuff about building safe rooms because it's a good thing for safety. We need to find common ground and, and be respectful of people uh, even when they don't like us and perhaps they're the rare person that, that we have met that we don't care for either. We need to all work together. We need to think on a, in a systems analytical way about the problems we face. So many people come up with simplistic solutions to stuff. Uh, there is actually a major educational organization in this country that published a paper that basically indicated that all you have to do to solve the problems of mounting toll of flood losses is abolish the flood insurance program. At our pre predecessor conference two years ago here, several people approached me and said, all we have to do to solve the problem of mounting total disaster relief is abolish disaster relief. That's not quite going to do it. We need to look at collaboration and, and complex solutions, I'm afraid, to complex problems. And we need to change our system so that it rewards resilient and safe behavior and strongly discourages unsafe development and other activities, unresilient activities. And there are ways of doing this. We've done it in this nation with respect to urban fires. We rate communities separately on their ability to deal with urban fires. And over the last hundred years, we have tremendously reduced the, the, the annual occurrence of urban fires, the risks, the consequences, the life safety, and the damage to buildings. We know how to do this. We do it with economic incentives, moral incentives, and actually, uh, I often say, harnessing the power of the male ego, which is, which, is, it, which is a great monstrous dark thing that if you can harness is, is not a bad thing, and I can describe that if you want in the questions. We've got to stop making things worse. We've got to look at these systems and recognize increasing damages. There's no question that damages are bad and getting worse. These are numbers from an insurance company. This is not an agency. This is not an advocacy. Thing. These are just numbers from Munich Reinsurance. Stuff shooting up. But this is really important. It's not just climate change. Climate change may play a role. This is a wonderful research project by Dr. Roger Pilkey, Jr., who points out that this is just historic storms superimposed on today's land use. It's not a nice, simple little thing going up. It's sporadic, depending upon where it is. This is a repetition of the 1926 Miami hurricane. This is a repetition of the 1900 Galveston flood. 
we have more and more people, more and more expensive stuff in harm's way. And that's just a fact. The demographic trends of the future, Chris Nelson, Arthur Nelson, 50% of the built environment we'll see in the year 2050 does not exist today. What an opportunity. Stefan Halligat from the World Bank points out that we've got to stop talking about climate change as gloom and doom. It's an enormous business opportunity. This planet, this world, will spend trillions of dollars on adaptation. Either we'll spend it on maladaptation, making things worse, or we'll make things better. We are at a fork in the road. We can either do things that will make stuff better over a long term. We will pay Mother Nature now a few pennies or pay with misery, suffering, and loss of life down later. This is a key point. It's not too late. We have a huge opportunity. So the best form of climate adaptation, natural hazard mitigation, is building safely and properly, both before a disaster and after a disaster. I want to quickly mention, there's a, a case that has attracted a great deal of press attention. It's Coons versus the St. John's River Water Management District. A lot of folks commented on it and said, oh my god, the sky is falling, it's just terrible. Uh, I don't think it is. I think that the Supreme Court, one of the most conservative Supreme Courts in, in American history, is pointing us in the right direction. They're saying that, the Supreme Court is saying that insisting that a landowner internalize the negative costs of their development is the hallmark of sound land use planning. And that's what we're talking about here, building safely and properly. For those of you that are an economist, a negative externality is a cost of the transaction which is not absorbed by the person that's doing the transaction, making the money. A developer builds something, builds it improperly, poor stormwater management, externalizes a flood to a whole bunch of folks, externalizes diminution in water quality to a whole lot of other people, and does not absorb the costs. Uh, and as, as is pointed out by uh, Robert Frank, and uh, talking about Robert Kors, very conservative people, by the way, that the planet's survival depends upon people being responsible for what they do. Who pays for disaster assistance in this nation? All y'all. Thank you. Through a vast system, a cornucopia of programs, the Internal Revenue Service, non-appropriated funds, the Casualty Loss Program, Small Business Administration loans, FEMA, grant, uh, FEMA loans, FEMA grants, HUD Community Development Block Grant money, huge amounts of money, all documented in this publication, which is available online, and of course by the disaster victims, and by God they pay too. But who benefits is a totally different group. The developer the local government with tax revenue. We've got to keep that in mind. The very people that are doing the regulations are the ones that are getting the payback. Uh, uh, I'm not talking about improper paybacks, by the way, just the, the, the tax returns. Uh, communities, state governments, a whole, lot of, whole panoply of people, and also the occupants of floodplains. We've got to come together. This is America's first political cartoon. Put, published uh, in, in, uh, in May, of, I believe, a, uh, 1754, Ben Franklin, saying that the colonies had to unite, had to come together. This is 20 years before the revolution. Just now, we have to come together. Who has to come together? All of us in this room. The journalism profession, working together with everyone in this community of adaptation, everyone who cares about a safe, sustainable, and just society. Thank you. And back over to you for questions. Thank you for enduring this.